Hey folks, I think you're really going to love today's conversation. Today's podcast is with the team at Warrington, which is Tom Spears and Tessa Friedman. And Tom graduated from Fort Zumwalt South High School, and he continued his musical education at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. He served as the director of bands at the Ellsbury R2 School District for seven years until coming to Warren County R3. He currently performs locally in a variety of groups and is the baritone sax player for the St. Louis Wind Symphony. Tessa Friedman is the band director of Black Hawk Middle School and the assistant band director at the high school in Warrington. And she team teaches the 6th and 7th grade bands uh, along with the Warrington Marching Warriors and the Warrington Symphonic Band. And she spearheads the Black Hawk Middle School 8th grade band and the Color Guard. Originally from Fulton, Missouri, she attended MSU from 2005 to 2012, where she earned her Bachelor of Music Education and a Master's Degree in Wind Band Conducting. And while at MSU, she performed with the University Wind Ensemble, the Wind Symphony, the Symphonic Band, the Jazz Band, and various entertainment ensembles. She studied with Dr. Belva Prather, Mr. Jerry Hoover, and Dr. Grant Peters. Prior to moving to the Warren County R3 School District in 2018, Tessa taught for six years as the assistant band director in the Moberly Public Schools. This is her 10th year in public education in Missouri. I'm really excited to talk about our conversation today. We just brainstormed off the top of our heads a couple of things we want to talk about, but I'm sure as we get going, we're going to find all kinds of other cool bits of wisdom to share. But one of the things that I think has impressed some of your peers and why they wanted to hear what you all had to say on the podcast was that you've had a lot of success building a traditional music program, but in a rural area and growing it. And it just seems like, especially once the two of you got together and I, I, and obviously Tom, you had a, a really good assistant before and, and Tom, oh shoot, what's Tom's last nice name? Tom. Say it again. Tom Perry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I was like, I remembered his first name, but it dropped his last name, but it just seems like it's, it's continued to grow. So tell me a little bit about how you have gone about trying to build a quality music program and a growing program in a rural area like Warren? I think the big thing is just getting kids into the door that maybe weren't in the door in the first place. And that's a hard thing for band directors to swallow. We start them in sixth grade and in our program, we get to carry them all the way up, which I think is a huge part of our success is that we both see them day one and we both see them their last day of high school, which a lot of programs don't get that. So with that kind of power, it's awesome. But we also, I learned early in my career, there's kids that skip through the cracks. Like I've had kids that were amazing band kids in high school, wanted to take home ec their sixth grade year and didn't sign up for band. And then they got lost in the program. And I know previously in this program, they had tried several variations of things to try and get those kids back in. We were lucky enough to find drumline and marching band as a good pathway back into band for kids. And we did a lot of, I worked with a gentleman by the name of Greg Coots, who's a outstanding percussion percussionist and was in the Zumwalt South world when I was there in high school. And his wife, um, Chris Coots also worked there and they were, became lifelong teacher, mentor, friends. And he came in and helped us really well to start to bring some of those kids back. So we do a chop shop program that kids come and we do it on Saturdays and they come for the day. And so basically it was a, it doesn't matter if you've ever touched music in your life, we're going to teach you everything to be a member of a drum line. And so that became a real good pathway for kids who didn't make it in the program before to come back. And when you have that kid that shows back up after a long period of time, and it's like, I really miss band, but I don't remember how to play my instruments. We would say, come join us at chop shops. And I think that was a huge help, a way to get kids back in the programs. And Greg was really good about going out and, and even teaching me how to go find those, as he calls them, the lost kids, the kids that don't really have something that they're a part of and really could be super successful. And we were able to pull a lot of those kids in. The first few years, it was teaching a kid, here's a C on a marimba and writing parts for those kids until they could learn how to play. And then it became to a point now where the kids are training the other kids. We have kids stay after all the time that are showing another kid how to play tenor who saw it or showing another kid how to play snare. And we don't go easy. And you don't make our snare tenor line without having chops and without doing the work. and. We give them the tools, we give them a, a big handbook of here's how you do it. And if you do the work, there's a place for you. 
And we've been shocked at that. So I would say that was one huge avenue of pulling some of those kids in in a non-traditional area that maybe your parents couldn't afford an instrument in sixth grade. We used to lose kids to that. And we've taken in that world, we've taken it. If you want to be in band and you're willing to put some work into it, we're going to find you an instrument to play. We've had sure it's there, but the other avenue would be, I think where Ms. Friedman could really chime in here would be through our color guard program is another place where you have students that aren't traditional band kids, or maybe they were a band kid, but just didn't have that same passion for an instrument. And we've been able to turn that into a rather successful guard program that has helped really grow once again, the numbers of the band and the size. Cause this year we marched 130 in a rural area, which is up there in the numbers. When I started in Warrington, we were in the 65 range yep. and we've been able to, as I said, and it's not just, we start more kids in six and we've created a really positive family atmosphere that I think plays heavily into it. But I think through the area of drumline and through color guard, which I think Ms. Friedman could talk a little bit about. We were able to take a lot of those kids that had slipped through the cracks who loved music in some way, shape or form and, and bring them back into a program and make them part of something, which is the overall goal. In my opinion, we're all just trying to have some sort of positive influence on kids. Yeah. Before we get into guard, cause I definitely want to get into that. Cause I, I think <laughs> yeah. that's something that would, it would be very helpful. I want to talk a little more about chop shop. So I do, I think a lot of people do have the idea of recruiting former players to try to get them back in, which I think is a yeah. great idea. And, and you're, I think you're, you're obviously on the right path of thinking about reaching those who we've, who were in the activity at one point and then, then left. So if a kid played saxophone before we, we could try to get them back in and even back in on saxophone if possible. I think that's great. And I think yeah. a lot of directors are doing that, but the idea of getting them back into another role or even getting someone who's never been in it into a role, I think that's something that I don't hear done often a lot. And I made a quick note of Crystal Boyd, but she started in, I, th I believe she started in band in high school Yeah, uh, and wanted to play the trumpet and she was in the percussion section and also learned to play the trumpet. And now she's in the National Guard uh, Reserves and does the Army Reserve Band and a, a music educator all from starting in high school, basically. Yeah. And which is a tremendous su success yeah. story. So tell me about how this chop shop thing, like in general, when you bring someone in, is there an already a, a, like a, a guideline of how you're, where you're starting them or is it dependent on each kid? Kind of walk me through how that program works. It's so it's all based around what is dubbed the book of magic. And this would be a, a Greg Coots thing. And it's something I grew up with. And then I've, he's given me the resources. And as I said, he's been a mentor to me every step of my career. And it was something that he was able to pass on and he builds these lessons, these life lessons. And that's a theme that will probably come out throughout this podcast is that our focus and, and my focus, my entire career has been teaching life skills. And I think a lot of directors take that approach, but finding things, trying to make these kids good people as long as well as good musicians, because if you have great people in a band, as we learned this year with our change in things, if you have great people in a band. You can run a band program without 25 staff. You can put a lot of trust in kids. So this book of magic is created and it has these rules of drumline and it has these laws and, and most of them are based around Greg's life experience and my life experience and mesh together into these kind of overall good things. He has the dead sea scroll. So dedication, you have to be dedicated, put in great effort, have a great attitude, and you have to have the desire to want to do good things. And. And then he has these kind of life lessons that most of your life is about the memories and making memories. And he helped to build a family atmosphere. And that was something I was already doing and he helped do that. So what we did is our, when I got there, my drum line was tiny. I had a snare, a tenor, a couple basses, one person in our pit. And I knew what a competitive marching band was going to take. And that wasn't going to be it. So we invested a lot of money in equipment up front. I used the new teacher slogan, new teachers out there. Your first year, go ask your principal for everything. They don't say no a whole lot your first year. Your second year, they've learned to say no a little bit more, but go ask for everything. I asked for three more. I told them, they said they wanted to build a program. I said, I need three marimbas and two vibes and a baseline and this. And they were like, how much is that going to cost? And I'm like, only about 80. <laughs> Sell it down. They're used to, we think as band directors, we forget that they spend a hundred thousand dollars on an air conditioner unit for school. So if this is maintenance of the program and stuff. So. I'd say go out and ask for stuff. And once we had the equipment, 
we had to put kids on it. Otherwise it was going to waste. So we literally took anybody who would walk in the door. So it was, it's 12 weeks all on a Saturday. We start at eight in the morning and we'd end at five o'clock at night when we were first starting. We've whittled that back. We've become more efficient and we've become, we need less. We don't need to pull 30 kids. We had 31 in drumline this year and we're graduating three. So wow. we'll probably pull in another 15 for chop shops. We're running out of places to put them, but I'm not turning kids away that are willing to do work and you have to show up. You have to put in the time. They pay a small fee because there's a lot of wisdom in the kids have to have something invested in the program. Just yep. even that $50 that they have to ask their parents for and come up. Now with that $50, they get a t-shirt. They get a, everybody gets the same pair of drumsticks that are wrapped with tape, ready to roll. So you got something to go home and practice. Everybody gets their book that has all their music and stuff in it. That's all part of that fee. And everybody gets um, snacks and stuff of the day. We have either we'll have pizza or we'll have, we just buy a whole bunch of, we go to all these and raid all these and just have snacks and sodas and waters because they're going to be hanging out all day. We've learned over the years and Greg really showed me the light on the fact that once you get them in the door, the kids don't really want to leave. They would hang out and play drums all day, every day, if you let them. Right. And a lot of the times it's our time. That's the thing that's valuable as far as we have families and lives outside of school too. But we've learned that if you can get them in the door, they love to come for a Saturday and hang out all day and play drums. Yeah. And it was truly at the beginning teaching. Here's a kid. Here's where a C is up. Oh, you only got one note that bar. We'll get one note in the next bar, get one note here. And I had this epiphany at the beginning of my career in Ellsbury that I was able to take musicians or people who had basic knowledge of stuff and put them on a percussion instrument. And not that percussion is easy because we all know to play percussion takes a little bit more than just hitting a drum. We, we all know that, but if you understand rhythms and you can follow and you have a whole lot of people around you that can, it's amazing with watching the music and having basic concepts that they start to learn to read music without me going, here's a quarter note, here's right. an eight. So we had success there and it was a struggle at first. And we brought in the beginning, it was a lot more staff. And as I said, as time goes on, we'll talk about another theme here. We always talk about building traditions at our school and that everything is, every previous generation has an impact on the next thing. When you walk out my band room doors above the door, it says building a tradition of excellence. And that was, that's been our mantra, our theme, our thing. And so what we found is year one, we maybe needed eight or nine people to teach all these kids. Year two, we needed five because now we had kids that could lead a symbol section who could start to teach kids mouths. Now <laughs> being Freeman walk in, we have amazing students who we had some boys this year that I would have thought could have never replaced a mallet who were doing dances and spins and flipping just because we had leadership that was like, no, this is what we do. This yeah. is how it's done. And it's amazing. Some of the, we would stand back and go, could you have gotten them to do that? And she'd know I could. In a million years, I would have never thought that kid would be doing that right there. That's what came of it. You build these bonds, you build the relationships, you sell the family. Like you sell, some of these kids still have a family to go home to that's a normal family and they can come to school and some days they hate each other. Some days they love each other. But in the end, we still end every day with that thing. So Chow Shop became that path in. And then once it was known, the kids sell it now. It's somebody says, oh, I miss band. They're like, you should come join Chop Shops. Come step into Chop Shops. Come, come see that. Personally, I haven't had a lot of luck with kids coming back to their instrument in high school. I wish I had. I wish that was a pathway that I saw an easy way to make happen. Yeah. But in our environment, where we're teaching the lessons after school, we're doing the solo and ensemble. We are the private instructor. We don't have kids taking private lessons very often or maybe very top elite that just need more than we can give them. So when you're the lessons and everything, we didn't have the time. We don't have time, unfortunately, to go back. Drumline was a thing. Hey, we're going to block off this time. We're going to be there all day. If you show up and you do work, we'll find a place. I, I think the only reason I mentioned about reaching those who had quit to come back I think that's a, a tactic that I, that many directors use, but it has very small, like limited results. Like maybe you get a kid a year or so, a couple yeah. tops from that and kids is not going to help you grow to where we're talking about. Whereas when you open it, when to think, think more uh, broadly about percussion and guard, man, you can now start getting into double digits in terms of the numbers you can add to your, your program. 
And I know not being a percussionist myself, and I had one semester of percussion methods. <laughs> a lot of people learn that thing. A lifetime ago. But it does seem like the kind of instrument that if you'll just put the time in it, like you can get competent pretty quickly. Whereas on a lot of the wind instruments, certainly on brass players, man, I don't know. I know a lot of people that put a fair amount of time in their instruments yeah. that still sound <laughs> terrible. So, cause you've got like embouchure and everything that's important is invisible. Like, but with the wind instrument, you can't, everything that is relevant to how they sound and play, you can't actually see it. It's all happening up behind the mouthpiece and in their mouth and in their body. But with yeah. percussion, you can see the sticks or mallets in their hands. You can see the thing they're supposed to hit right in front of you. You can see the actual note. The note is right in front of you. Just hit it. Like it's so much easier than it's just out there in the ether and you have to find it. There's no break. So there's no like clarinet break or anything. Anyway, it just yeah, you, seems like it's an easier. You on like a bass line because that's a thing where you, ha you have to know how to read music. But the reality is when you see do and you feel out where you go, it's amazing those kids who have never read music. And a lot of, as I said, Greg was a big inspiration for this. I was lucky enough and, and one of something that's helped us obviously is that I was in drumline in high school. I took that path along with playing saxophone and stuff. So I had that in stuff and Greg was my percussion instructor in, in high school. So I had this, but we had one of the best bass lines in the state of Missouri. And consistently we would go out and we just, we played really well together. And the fifth bass guy was a, was a pole vaulter. He had never played music in his life. He was a junior, Greg, we call him Buddha, found him out in the, uh, out in the school one day and says, you should be in drumline. And he came in and he couldn't read music. Greg was able to write the music for the, the kids. And that's a huge advantage too. That is something that not everybody has that thing, but I would recommend for directors, even if you have basic knowledge, when I was in Ellsbury, I rewrote every percussion part for every percussion. And I think if you do that, you open yourself up because I can have a, a marimba player who knows 12 notes and I can write a part that they can play. And it's amazing. They'll learn to play that in the first month and I can hand them another part that's a little bit harder and a little bit harder. And then at the end of the year, they they know how to read. They can play all the warm ups, And that's the other thing. We do a lot of warm ups with them that they may not get all the notes and you have to learn, Hey, you're going to be in a drum line. There's a lot of people around you that are going to get, doesn't mean you have to be perfect today. Right. It means you need to take one step towards getting better. If you got one note on that exercise, get two. If you got two, get three. And eventually you're going to hit them all. Like yeah. but you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to take a risk. And, and that's, those are all huge skills for going to the workforce. But as in business and stuff, you have to be willing to fail. You're going to fail a ton in your life, a ton. And if that's, if we're not teaching that as band directors or allowing kids to fail, we're failing because we are, I'm a perfectionist. I want everything to be perfect. Freeman's the same way on a lot of things like, and especially as wind players, we know. If you don't hold the trumpet, if you don't hold the trombone, if you don't hold the saxophone, you're not going to be as successful as if you do. But right. percussion is one of those places where I can hand you a stick and you can hit it wrong and I can show you how to hit it and you can show you again how to hit it. And it doesn't take maybe those same things. And as I said, there's those fundamentals, but drum lines seem to be an avenue where we went to match grip for everybody very specifically. So we taught one way. And in middle school, we hand every kid in sixth grade, a pair of drumsticks when we do rhythms and we start teaching them there how to, 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 so even if they don't make it, it's like there. And I would say that's another, we could maybe side topic on this thing is that we've eliminated percussion in the sixth grade level, which is a little controversial. Uh, okay. I've, I've yeah. had this idea for years and every time I bring I, it up, people look at me like I just cursed an eye. You're not. So tell me about it. Tell me, tell me. Let's, I'm let's, sorry I'm talking so much. No, we're going to come back to people. color run, I promise, because that's yeah. an important part of it. But I so, definitely want to hear about this idea. This was something in, I started in Ellsbury and it was a small enough program. By the time I was the, starting this program, we were starting 60 kids a year. I had worked out, go make friends with your counselor, go talk to him. And I had asked. What can I do? Like I was going to sixth grade and I introduced it and then kids would sign up. I was like, can I bring every kid to my room for two days? And they were like, yeah, why not? I was like, so every kid, I'm just going to have him come down to the banner room. I'm going to talk to him. Like, yeah, that's fine. And then it was, can I have him for a week? Yeah, sure. The teachers would love an hour off at the end of the day. So every kid came to the band room. So it was no longer, did you sign up for band or not? It was, I'm going to spend a week with these kids and convince them to be in music. And we'd put up our instrumentation on the board and do all that. So anyway, so it started in that where I was trying to get as many kids involved in the program and we were starting a lot of kids. 
but I wasn't having as much success with trombone players, trumpet players, all these instruments that I knew without, I could have 10 percussionists. Everybody wanted to play percussion. I can't build a band with just percussion. I, you mm -hmm. know, Greg would love, <laughs> my, my <laughs> percussion instructor would love right. a, a band of all percussionists. But so I, I made the choice at some point, once again, I had learned through these chop shops and through doing these things, which I had begun doing in Ellsbury of these training sessions that I could take a kid who hadn't played an instrument and teach the percussion. And I was learning that when I was starting percussionist, they would get to a certain point, but they hated the bell kit. I sold it as well as I could. I'm a decent salesman. I could not sell the bell kit as something great. And I knew without reading music, that they weren't going to be successful down the road because I was going to need them to play mouths. I was going to need them to understand what a G on a staff was or an F. So. I started seeing all these gaps in the things and I made a controversial decision at the time, which was, I'm going to teach you percussion in seventh grade, but you need to start on an instrument. And that, it eliminated a whole bunch of classes that I had to teach. It eliminated a whole area that I had to teach. And it became a, an avenue for me to maybe six kids that wanted to play percussion. Maybe two of them fall in love with the trumpet before they ever make it to percussion. And that doesn't mean they can't play percussion, but it means they play trumpet on three tunes and percussion. On. And I was able to take those kids. And if you can read a rhythm and, and play the articulation with your tongue, and I teach you how to hold drumsticks, you can play a snare rhythm on a snare drum and you yeah. can play a timpani on a thing. So I, I just found the success there and it paid out for two or three years. There were my drumline program at the high school group because I had more percussionists. My program grew because I had more kids that stuck with it. I wasn't losing six of my seven percussionists every year because they were bored because I'm teaching trombone and clarinet and flute and everything in the same class. Of course, yeah. the percussionist is bored. Like I didn't yep. blame them. I, yep. I understood and they told me they were bored. I asked kids, I, I said, no offense whatsoever. Tell me why you're like, why don't you want to be here? I, I fully support you leaving, but just give me something. I'm bored. You're right. You. I should have done better for you. And it was one of those things where I was like, I can engage kids hire. How many administrators tell us that every day? I can yep. My engagement, I can do this and I can still have a successful progression. So this year in Warrington is our first year of making that full switch. So it's our first year where we started no percussions last year and we switched them this year. And we've learned some things on a program this scale because it's different than it was in Ellsbury, but we have learned. Our percussionists read rhythms way better than before, but they're weaker at mallets right now. So that's something we can continue to improve. We are lucky that we team teach, which is a thing. So I pull percussion and go teach a totally separate class to a seventh grade where I'm teaching them basic rhythm stuff and I'm teaching them, here's the notes on the mallets. And as I said, they're not loving it and they're not successful right out of the gates, but it, it's getting there. And then as we start concert music, there's days we're here and we're days we're in our room. So two days a week, maybe I'm in the classroom down there teaching and two days they're with us. And we had a really successful concert with percussionists who had never played percussion prior to this year. Now we do start at the very end of six. We take those kids interested in it. We show them their first thing. Here's a pair of cymbals. Here's how you hold them. Crash when it gets to your beat. And they already know how to count rests. They already know how to read music. So finding that crash is way easier than it was for a kid who had only learned mallets prior. And so all these things now, five years from now, maybe I'll look back and say it doesn't work at a larger program. I'm pretty positive. That's not going to be the result. Like we're going to do it again next year. We're going to continue. We didn't start any this year. And I think it'll be a pathway for a while and we'll see where it pays out. But we were finding that success at the high school. We were finding that success in the middle school. So it, it's, it's only logical at that point, but go ahead. Yeah. I think um, it's important to remember also when you're looking at a sixth grader, they're small people like yeah. and oddly every year they seem to get smaller, but they're also like very young. And so when you set them up on the, we were using the wood mallets because I do think it's a better transition into playing on an actual marimba than the little metal ones. Like by the time a sixth grade kid, a little tiny sixth grade kid drags their stuff down the hallway and they set up and they have a stand and they put their book up and their book falls down and they lose their mallets and something falls out of their bag and they get everything set up so it's not wobbly. We were getting not a lot of quality instruction with those kids. 90% of the class period was just getting these tiny people to set up something that was far, really far too big for them to be dealing with. And then the whole disconnect of I'm seeing it on the paper, but now my hands have to do this thing and I have to look down here and there's all these notes going on. And then I'm having to look up and look down. And I'm, what we were finding is that they were all just memorizing their music. 
And so they weren't actually reading music. They were just learning a pattern and doing the pattern. And so then when you gave that, we were like, oh, well, our kids can play mallets. Well, then you give them a piece of sheet music and it turns out they can't actually play mallets. They can play Good King Wenceslas and Mary Had a Little Lamb because <laughs> that's what got stuck in their brain when they were playing. I, I think like when you put a kid on trumpet and you're like, okay, the bottom line is E, it's one, two, and you blow the air. All of that is very compact. There's not a lot of stuff going on outside of them. And I do think that makes a difference. They're reading music better. They know what it sounds like. They know all of that stuff. And we tell band kids all the time, band kids can sing. And even a percussionist, if you know what that pitch sounds like, you're going to know when you hit a wrong note. You're going to know when it feels wrong, when it sounds wrong. And so I think just starting that in a little bit more compact of a world, even on trombone, where it's a bigger instrument and there's a lot going on, everything is very contained into their body. And so before you're like, all right, you've got to carry this mallet and this stand and this book and this bell kit and this rolls. And then you have a snare stick, snare sticks and mallets and a practice pad. It's like a lot of stuff. Yeah. And it's very overwhelming. And I think we have found a lot that it's just easier for us, <laughs> for the kids, for the parents. It's less to keep track of. And they're learning the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, They're learning the same things. And so it's just like, why give them that headache to deal with when we could teach it somewhere else and then just transfer it when they're a little bit more those um, like developmental traits have happened. Yeah, so I, I think that's a big part of it that so many people look over is, would you be able to carry around all that stuff? Every day? <laughs> no, I wouldn't want to. I would forget something. I would not have it. I would not be prepared. And it's less exciting to take it home and practice with it because ugh, I got to take that big thing and then get all that yeah. done. It, just the logistics. Driveway. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, just the it's, logistics it's not of pulling this crap around is yeah, It's not enticing to us as adults, so it's not going to be enticing to a person that's half of our size trying to manage the same equipment. So. Yeah. And you're still teaching them in seventh grade how to play a timpani and a bass because you're not doing that. We teach specialized classes we were going to another room to teach percussion it didn't work to stay in a room and even if it did you don't have time in sixth grade to you could, we used to do a tour of percussion instruments and show them the activities but you're still teaching that in seventh grade whether you like it or not you're teaching that with literature we all do it's, mm -hmm. it's why we have literature so you said it very well there mr even of that it just it became it opened up these things and we even reflected this year after our first concerts man we had less time issues we had less issues with engagement. And here's the thing. If you got 14 percussionists and they all know how to play instruments, guess what the seventh and aren't playing are going to play an instrument. Like yeah. band directors complain that they have kids that have nothing to do. Or if it's a scale day, everybody sits down with an instrument and they play their scales and then they go learn it on mallets because they've already remembered the notes. And there, there's some different, they have two sets of scale sheets and one I work on them with in the classroom and one they have when they're sitting with the whole class, but scales are our foundation for us, because it's what music is like music is a whole bunch of scales in different orders. And so we, we teach that way. And I think that's the right. I do think it's the right answer. I don't know if it's for every school. I don't know if it's for every program, but I think it's something that educators should look at as a definite option. You have to sell it though. That's the other thing. There can be great confusion with this. There can be kids who think I can't be in band if I don't want to be Russian. We are very clear to say, no, we want a Awesome. You want to play percussion? Great. Can you just pick a trumpet or a clarinet or a flute and you're going to start there and then we're going to put you on percussion as soon as possible. And yeah. then kids are okay with that. They want to learn two instruments. Every kid does. They're like, oh, I'm going to have, I'm going to know two instruments. Yeah, you are. And like, they're pumped about it. It's hard for some kids and we probably lose a few kids who don't want to learn another. I just want to play drums. But the reality in my brain is those are kids that probably weren't going to make it past sixth grade. Maybe I'll learn down the line. Maybe I'll find a couple kids that have come back and said, I didn't do band because I didn't do percussion. But I think if you sell it right at the beginning and you explain it to the parents and you make sure that everybody understands, we want percussionists. Look at my drum. Well, like, and with your five in our drum line, like I have not, with not one with your drop shops program, you're getting those kids later anyway, if they didn't yeah. come in. And I, I just feel like with percussion, because I had this conversation with a couple of guys that are, they're actually percussion specialists. And of course the percussion specialists don't like the idea, but I felt like they were just a little myopic in their view based on their experience. Because when I go into middle school band rooms all across Missouri, I see percussionists sitting back there with nothing to do. They're almost always the number one discipline problem. Stuff, like put holes in the wall. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> no, you're a hundred percent. And that's the same. We all see the same thing. And it was just, that was a reaction to that. And Ellis Perry, I was one man doing everything. So as much of that distraction I could get rid of, it made me want to teach more. Cause when kids aren't engaged and they're having, and they're not having, it's deflating as an instructor. It even gets that way in high school because we wanted to build this huge drum line, but now we have the beast of concert season comes. And I have 35 percussionists who all want to play parts. And that has become an issue. And it's still one of those things I'd solve. When I first got here, most of the percussionists left after marching season. So we had eight or nine and then four would stay for concert season because they just didn't want to be there. And I've found a way to sell it that they want to be there now, but now I have to deal with 30 percussionists. There's a thing, but to me, I'm still offering those kids a good experience. We're still doing pep band and other things. So there's days that those kids are hundred percent engaged and you have to sprinkle those throughout. We're doing, there's going to be pep band days where Tuesday and Thursday of this week, you're going to play the whole hour and maybe Wednesday and Friday, you're a little bit bored, but you have to play on a tune. So you, we'll get to your tune. You'll play something every day. It just may not be as much as the clarinet player. And if and you think- want to go play your instrument, we have a ton of them that are in drum line who then in concert season, go and sit and play an instrument. That's awesome. All the time, like trumpet players, clarinets. We have consistent, same thing with color guard. We have color guard members who are love music and love band and they go color guard and then they come back and they're right in our concert band and it it works beautifully in our program for sure. Tom and I run a concert band with 110 kids in it. Yeah. Uh, And you have to make programmatic choices about things like that. And yep, a lot of our concerts are pretty punch them in the face with sound and music and things like that. But our parents love it. They they love that about them. And we do pick a lot of stuff, I think, that keeps those kids engaged a lot. So yeah, it, I think it, it's a give and take for sure. There's another benefit, too, when you have normally our percussionist, when we started in sixth grade, they are they have their parts down before anybody else does, which is why they're bored. And if now if you put the shoe on the other foot and they're in seventh grade and they're actually maybe a little behind where everybody else is at, there's a little bit of that pressure of, I got to like kind of pay attention to what's going on here because everyone else is getting through this okay and I'm having to learn it. And now they're actually really engaged the whole time. You just hit the nail on the head 100%. I actually hadn't even thought about it that way, but you're 100% right that they are a little behind everybody and there is this frantic, oh my gosh. And there's the kids in the clarinet are looking back at the snare player like you're dragon and those snare players go home and they work their butts off. So they're not the reason that the band is. And it's not that they can't do it, it's that they haven't developed this yet. But a lot of that's what I'm doing in the classroom too. The first couple months, they're really weak with their, they don't have chops. They don't, all those things that I'm sure those core percussion people you're talking to are like, why don't they have those? But the reality is, They have other skills. These are the things we're developing now. Flipping the script. It's the same thing. It's just you're flipping the script on when. Instead of teaching mouths in sixth grade, we're teaching the rhythm and stuff that they'd probably learn as they got more advanced stuff. And and we leave out some of the, the rudiments and stuff until they get to eighth grade because we're teaching them the thing. So we take a lot of roles out of our marches. You see that role there, we're doing quarter note. Now that doesn't mean that's not something I'm teaching in the classroom to them. They are. We're talking about flams. We're talking about roles. But we're approaching them from a double stroke role sometimes instead of a buzz role because a sixth grade band, they teach buzz roles, number page seven, Those right. kids buzzing, and then they have horrible technique because they never learned the right. We leave all that stuff out when we're teaching them in seventh. They already know how to read the rhythms. But now I can say, see that slash, we're going to play that as a double. And then we're going to play the, the triple slash roles as 16th notes. And so now we're changing their percussion parts. And then it's a matter of, okay, now that you know all that, Oh, by the way, if you just buzz those 16th notes, it's going to make this awesome roll and boom, then they have that skill. So it's flipping the script on how it is. And I think if people just take time, that's the big thing. I, I love that. Uh, and this whole chop shop idea, which obviously I need to do a future episode with Greg Coots and talk through that. But yeah, I think as we think about our ensemble, certainly one way that we can not only just bring numbers, but also fill it out sonically is to have more percussion, especially front ensemble and for concert band and especially in marching band, we just see the importance of having a quality and strong front ensemble. Gosh, it's just been such a major part of marching band today. And so a program like this does a great job for that. Another though, a very important part of filling out the look of, of our marching band and getting more kids around musicians and music makers and fans of that is building the color guard. And I think that's an area that a lot of folks struggle in that you all have had some success with. So Tessa, why don't you talk to us about how you've gone about that and recruiting students for Color Guard and how you teach them and 
Tell, tell us your secrets. I came to have this kind of role in Warrington because my first year, Tom came to me and was like, can you just go do something with them? And I was like, okay. I have zero color guard experience. I did not do it in high school. I did not do it in college. I have recently picked up enough skill to be able to teach some very basic things, which turns out is all you need, everybody. You don't have to be like some like WGI alumnus to, to be able to teach these kids. But what we're doing, I, I think we're slowly trying to work the color guard angle into um, that kind of chop chop angle. And so the first thing we do, I, I teach most of my day at the middle school. And I know that the majority of our recruits are going to come from those incoming freshmen that are coming in. I send a full staff email to the entire middle school staff around the beginning of April. And I say, hey, let me know some kids that you think enjoy music. They're creative. They hang out around a lot of band kids. They maybe look like they need a place that they need to be, an activity that they would be into and things like that. And I amass a list because the teachers deliver. I probably have a list of 30 to 40 names that come to me every year from just the middle school teachers. And I email each one of those kids. We do a series of clinics before we do auditions. That's like the chop shop aspect. We come, we teach some basic skill. We teach very simple choreography. We have all of the returners that can come show up so that they are spinning and I mix them in so that everybody is in together. And I reach out to each one of those kids and I tell them the dates and the times and the locations of those things. I tell them that we want them to be there. I share that list of prospective students that are interested with the current Color Guard members. So if they know anyone of them personally from their days in middle school, or if they know their older siblings or something, they can reach out to those students. And we have had anywhere from 30, 35 people between beginners and returners show up to one of these clinics. And it's not for all of them, and but we give them an opportunity to find out if it's for them. Right. Um, and, and I watch and I, I tell them all the time, like you can learn the choreography, that's great. But if you have a bad attitude, that's not what we're looking for here. If you can't get any of the choreography, but you're laughing and you're having fun and you're trying and you're taking your stuff home every day and you're practicing, yeah, that's what we want. That's what we're looking for. And in fact, this year, we started what we call the apprenticeship program. We marched 20 on the field and we had three in what we call an apprenticeship program. So they shadowed a returning member as they set drill. They learned all of the same routine. They were held to all of the same standards and then they were ready to jump in. So for example, we had one that I knew was going to be absent for a football game in October. She had told me way back, like at the in July, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. I was able to put one of those apprentice kids with her who maybe struggled a little during camp to learn that quickly, but she was able to practice for that spot all year and then jumped in at the football game. And then we were able to march without a hole, which was great for us. Um, and she was able to have kind of that home crowd experience and understand what it takes to be able to do that. We had another apprentice. She wasn't quite ready to take on the full responsibility of learning the work and stuff like that, but she plays flute. So she marched, but learned all the guard work as well and came to all of the rehearsals and, and she was there ready to roll and to learn. And so we are growing the next generation of the competitive guard in that apprenticeship program, which... I think Spears and I have talked about, we would like to expand that out a little bit past the guard and we were prototyping it a little bit. And again, we learned some things about what worked and what didn't and the expectations that we have for them. But I do think it was successful. It definitely gave some kids a place to feel like they were successful and that they belonged, which is a big thing for our program, but it didn't necessarily hold back the quality of the group, which is always a thing I think directors struggle with. We want these kids to have a place to be sometimes to our own detriment. And so we just created a place for them to grow. Um, they'll all be on our non-competitive winter guard. We have an open winter guard. If you show up to rehearsal, I'll put you in a show. And that does a lot. We gain a lot of people that way that are like, oh, I, I'm actually good at this. I'd like to learn this. And then we have a lot of kids who join that winter guard program because they want to go to school to be a band director. We have several that come out and they're instrumentalists and a couple of them going to school for music. And they're like, oh, I don't want to compete in the fall, but I want to know like when you say, when somebody says this, what does it mean? And that's something that is invaluable. It, it's something that we don't learn and they don't teach enough in college. People that are going into music ed. You still want to hold the quality of these groups high. And that's why yeah. we audition our drum line. So you, just because you come to chop shops and just because you show up, 
we do, I will say we push to keep every kid we possibly can, but it's not for everybody. And same thing with color guard, like those kids in that apprentice program, we have, you have two choices. You can cut everybody that doesn't make the group that is not going to be competitive, or you can say, okay, you two people, you didn't do any work. So you didn't make the group, but you three showed us that you want to be here. So let's give you a role. And, and they still come to rehearsals and those kids show up the same as every other kid there. They're still part of the family. They feel a part of the group every way, shape or form. And then even some of them, when we went indoor, we compete, we try and do an indoor garden and indoor drum line during marching season, just as a way for those kids to have another chance to express themselves. But those kids participated in our indoor guard, just as they were part of the group, cause they had already learned the routine. Now, some of them didn't do all three tunes cause they only knew maybe one or two. And that was their skill level now, right. but we still got to stand there and be in the uniform and perform. And judges didn't care that a kid was on the field for two and then offer, like nobody cared. Sometimes we get caught up in that. We get caught up in wanting to win. It's awesome to want to win. I, I think you should have that as a goal. I think being successful is never a negative thing, but it can't only be about the winning. It has to be about educating kids in music and in life. And that's yeah. what we're, we're able to do with these programs. And I, as I said, I did, I threw this been very much into the thing because in a program like this, and I'm sure there's a lot of directors in small schools that can re relate. I drove myself nearly insane writing color guard work and drum rewriting the drum parts and all that. When I started in Ellsbury, I was in a small school and I knew when I came to Warrington, I, I couldn't do it. Like I was like, I'm not going to be a band director in a few years if I keep doing this. So I found, I found really strong kids at first to keep going, but then I needed an educator there. You need a teacher, somebody that's there. And Zach Barber, who we referenced earlier came out and he would do a clinic, but he was still doing things. And I had people all along the way that helped to support it. We didn't do it single handedly. We needed support at the beginning. And then as Ms. Freeman was talking about a little bit here at the beginning is that this was our year where we flip the switch and can this program run with just the two of us and student leaders? And the answer right. is yes. Like you can bring in staff for these training sessions, for these chop shops, for these clinics. And we have, we have color guard people that help us write the work or there's tons of work being written out there. It's glorious right now as the March of director, you can buy a show with work. It's really good quality that addresses the drill in the way we'd want to. That doesn't mean I don't write my own shows. Yes, I've mo wrote plenty of marching shows and I, I change things, but a director in a small town can go buy a show and make it their own. We don't need yeah. every spin of everything. You teach no. the kid there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to, we've been talking about leaning on those students and things like that. When there's two of us running a 130 piece marching band, there were times when I had to look at my guard captains and say, you have to split off and you have to teach this. That is something that they need to be held to that standard before they get the job. They need right. to know, I'm going to put you down there and I need you to know the work. I need you to know the counts. I need you to teach it. And they taught themselves the whole third tune. I, I met with the captains over the summer, the work they had already, like, like the, the teaching DVD they had, but I split it up. We collectively split it into three sections and they taught it. I did not know the work. I did not know it. I did not know if it was being taught correctly. I taught them. Sometimes you have to make an executive decision and say, I can't really see what he's doing here, but I know enough about guard and I trust my skill and doing what I'm doing because in <laughs> surprise, tearing back the, the curtain a little bit, that guard had 20 competing members and three non-competing members. And two of them had done a competitive show before. And so it, it's a lot to look at those kids who have done this one time and say, you need to trust your skill and to be able to do this. But I mean, it, it also takes us as the adults saying, I trust you and I trust your skill. Right. And that's something our kids hear constantly. If you, we tell them and Spears, this is your thing, but it's true. It's if you make a decision, if you make an executive decision because you can't find us or you can't, it needs to be made in the moment. We are never going to be mad at you for making a decision. And communicating the decision and moving forward with the decision, even if it wasn't something he and I would have chosen, is it yeah. safe? Was it responsible? Was it respectful to the people around you? Did it get the job done? Yes. Then that is a decision that you made as a leader. I will be mad if you don't make a decision. I said, yeah, yes. <laughs> that's the worst thing that happened. Like our biggest frustration, especially as the program grew, because it grew large enough that it's not a two person program anymore, but it became 
make the best decision you can at the time. And you have to teach them to do this. It didn't happen in a year. This is right. not, as they talk, we talk about tradition. It's a culture. It's, it's it a is. culture. It, yeah. It's tradition is the culture. And it's, I was consistently shocked at when I gave kids responsibility, how much more they did than I expected. Like consistent. I think every director can relate to that. Like we'd give drum majors power and they would do 10 times what I would have expected them to do. Like they, we had drum majors like putting up whiteboards and putting calendars up in the band room. And if you give them a chance now, every once in a while, you have to say, eh, that's a decision for me. I appreciate right. you doing that, but I really need you to come to me first. And that, as long as you support them, don't ever shoot it down. You can kill this just as quickly as you can build it. You can stomp on one foot and make it not work. But I was super nervous with the decision of let's let the guard members learn. And they all had their parts. But the, the, the care at which they took to learn those parts was far greater than we could have ever expected. We expect them to wing it a little bit as they do with all their school. Yeah. But those the kids knew that it. To that is when you ask a kid to do something, you need to make sure, and this is something, this, the, the, what we skip 99% of the time as the professional adults is you have to model it. <laughs> They're not going to do it unless you model the way that you want it done. And so I came in, I taught them the first two color guard tunes in camp. I came in with written down count sheets. I came in with video. I came in with the the process for the day and the schedule. And I told them what we were doing from what time to what time. And they then started doing that. And it, it, you just have to show them what you want and they will respond to it. Yeah. Like, but if you go in, if I went in with no plan and I was like, well, I guess we'll do this today, that's how they're going to teach as well, because that's what they're viewing the teacher is. There's a mantra in training and teaching where I do it, you watch, you do it, I watch, and then you just do it. Yeah. And I think having that, that process is really important. And you all haven't gotten to hear this yet because of the time that we're recording this, but the interview I did with Rob Babel, that was something he discussed was using student leadership. And he had mentioned in the last couple of years, they actually now, they no longer call them section leaders. They call them peer mentors. And there's a few reasons behind that. And the main thing was trying to create a culture shift and a, and a paradigm shift in how these section leaders viewed their role, that they weren't there to be the boss. They were there to mentor their peers. Really and he that. really wanted to change their mindset because he was seeing times where people were being too bossy, too authoritarian or whatever. <laughs> But one of the comments he made was that he wanted to recognize, and it was important for him as a teacher to recognize and the students to recognize that he's the paid professional. They're not. And so he didn't yeah. want to put them in a position that they weren't ready to do, but yet there's a lot of things they could do that would help their band program and help themselves. And that's exactly what you guys are advocating here about building that culture for that, which is critical as we start to build a growing program that can ex uh, expand beyond just our own energies. And I would say this looks different at every program. If you, I would say what he's doing is very similar to what we're doing, but probably in a completely different way, which is the thing that I would encourage those people at smaller schools, because as I said, I was there, I, you can run yourself into the ground trying to be the greatest band director and having that a passion is wonderful, but at a certain point something has to give. And that was where, that's where Warrington was, is I knew I wanted a giant program. Okay. Now you have a giant program. Now, how do you not make it do the same thing that, it, that happened to you previously? I had immense support in Ellsbury from the community and from the staff and from the administration, all that stuff was there, but th that doesn't teach lessons till nine o'clock at night. Like those things you can still drive yourself nuts with. And I started getting to the point when we've done this in Warrington too, where the high schoolers come down and teach the middle schoolers and you have high schoolers that you have a great horn player. You say, Hey, you should go see Johnny. He just started horn. And those kids love to, they're like, let me show Johnny everything I know. And they're yeah. willing to make those things. And we have kids still today that go down to the middle school. They leave the high school. They drive across town to the middle school and they come sit down with the two, three, four kids that show up and just play music out of their books with them. And as I said, those traditions that that community and all that's what I grew up with. I'm always, I think we're trying to, as you said, we're always, we're recreating. I still say things that my band director said to me. I hear them come out of my mouth and I just go, oh my God, that was so what they said every time this situation arose. But guess what? That's how we all live. We all imitate what we know. Yeah. And if we don't know it, we try and learn it and we imitate it. And then eventually it becomes our own. I, I would not have a chalk shop if it wasn't for great coots. I would not have I would have, I had something similar, but he took it up a notch with the books and the, the skills. And he has, he's a fabulous writer. And it was like, he allowed 
so much more to happen because of his skills. And so I don't think it's a, you don't need anybody because I've had great mentors every step of the way. I'd say Bob Hansen was somebody that every, I learned to teach middle school band from Bob Hansen stopping by once a week and me going, yeah. how do you teach a trumpet player to do this again? Do you show me? Because yeah. unless you have that thing to imitate, like Ms. Freeman was just talking about, you have to have some sort of model to go off of, and then it can become your own. And that's what we learn with these kids is if you model it, then sometimes they take it way further than you would have. Like we may come in with a count sheet. They may come up with a count sheet that's better and like they yeah. have their own way to do it. And it's amazing sometimes what they're able to do. Sometimes yeah. it doesn't work that way. And we've had failures just as well as success there. We may have four drum majors and two go above and beyond and two don't. And, but you're learning something about those kids or maybe it's where they're at. So that's to me, the, the overall goal here is just to try and, and create a positive atmosphere and give kids, no matter whether you're in a giant school, unless no matter whether you have $200,000 for a marching program, or a lot of times we get by on two or $3,000, but still giving them the same experience and allowing them to go out and be as successful as they possibly can. I think that's important. I want to shift gears here real quick and yeah. talk about just the, the relationship you two have together and, and teaching together. And that's, it's so great for anyone who's had the experience of, you know, being the only band director to have someone that you teach with, it just really helps to share the burden, divide the workload and plus just gives you misery loves company. So <laughs> just having someone else there, that's but yeah. it can be very difficult though, to work together effectively on a team of two or more. And, and you all, uh, you two do seem to work really well together. Can you share some of the insights of what you've learned of like how to make this partnership effective? I think there has to be some sort of mutual respect, obviously, but I also think you have to put ego aside. I think that's a big thing that I struggle with too, is I would control every aspect of everything if I could, but I also have the life experience of teaching in Ellsbury where I know that doesn't make me happy. So. Is it worth me controlling everything to not be happy or is it better to give up just a little bit of that? And I say, it's not like everything's perfect every day. I'm, there's days she gets frustrated with me and vice versa. And I don't even think it's something that has to be said every time. I know when she's upset with me and she knows pretty much when I'm not happy and, and we discuss, or sometimes it is something we sit down and I go, I really would like to see this for sixth grade, or I'd really like to see seventh grade function this way. And a lot of times we agree. It's like a lot of times it's just that reality check where if she's like, I really wish fears that you would just do this way in the mornings. It'd make my life easier. I'm like, you're hundred percent. I probably should. So it's being able to take some of that. And then every once in a while, you do have to have somebody that has to be the end all be all. I think that's in the end, there has to be, I think we all have great ideas, but at some point, somebody has to make the thing. And as I said, I try and be that person at the high school and I try and allow her to be that at the middle school. I've been at the district a little longer. So sometimes there's some high up things that it's easy and sometimes not to be sexist in any way, but sometimes there's something that a woman can do better than a guy can. There's a situation to approach and sometimes there's things that I can handle that she you might, might not be comfortable with, whether it's with a female student or a male student, or whether it's just something I might relate to the superintendent different than she does, or she might relate to this principal better than I do. And you have to play to your strengths because we all have battles and it's sometimes it's my battle to pick. Sometimes it's hers. And sometimes at the high school, I know that if I go talk to this person, it's not going to get done, but I go, would you go ask if this can get done? And just the way that she approaches it is from a fresh perspective, it gets done and you just have to play. They, it's, there's a little bit of a game to all this. So like you have to know, you have to know who you're talking to and what you're talking about and, and what's possible. And we try and play on each other's strengths. There's a lot of times where I walk in the office and I go, I, I can you go do this for me? Cause I, I just can't today. It's not my day to do this. Like, I, I know this is my responsibility, but if you could, and a lot of times she's, yeah, I, that's not even a big deal where to me, it was, it would have taken every bit of energy. I had that day to do something like that, you know, whether it's making a flyer, sometimes that's. If there's that thing hanging over your head as a director, we go, I got to make that flyer later. And sometimes if I can just look at her and go, will you do this? Because it will make my whole day better. Absolutely. And vice versa. When she starts teaching seventh grade, is there anything I can do for you? To, oh, yeah. If you could copy that tune for eighth grade tomorrow, so I don't have to worry about it after school. Then make sure I was going to sit here and do read emails. I'd rather not do that anyway. Let me go and make these copies because I'd rather her go home at the end of the day. So she's happy the next day and she'd rather that I go home. 
And there's been a lot of times in, in our career where I have a young kid at home where she's like, oh, I got this. You need to go home and be with your family right now or don't come up here tomorrow. Like color guard, she took a lot of that off my plate this year. I don't want to see you up here on Sunday. And I'll go, I'm still going to stop by. And I might stop by for five minutes and she's like, we're good, go. Like, right. you can drive yourself nuts trying to control all that, but you have to have somebody that's willing to do that and that you want to work with in some way, shape or form. We don't see eye to eye on everything. Never will. Don't expect to. But we do see that you obviously from hearing us talk, we see the same path. And sometimes she lights up something that I'm like, man, I never would have thought of that and, and vice versa. And sometimes I want to try something one way and she goes, I think it would work better this way. Perfect. Yeah. We do a lot of that in the middle school where we've adapted things from other schools and other programs and her influence on that changed from when Tom was there before and from when Beth was there before. So everything has evolved with the people that are there, but you have to let it evolve. You can't be stuck. You got to keep evolving. Yeah. I think a lot of it too is, is just consistency. Like we consistently a lot of times take on the same jobs and and so it builds a level of of trust it builds a level of our expectation for each other and i think that's where a lot of team partnerships fall down is that you were doing this for two weeks and then you stopped that you never said why and, and and then there's animosity that builds about why you're not doing it anymore and and why some people feel like certain things are their jobs and other things are their somebody else's job it, you just have to check all of that there there are well, like it's a simple example of like I take attendance at the high school every morning. I just started doing that. It's not a thing that I had to, but I know Tom starts class every day. He's the first one on the podium every day. So like you have to sit down and think to yourself, what's the logical thing that I could do in the mornings that's useful? And when there's 130 kids checking into one classroom, that's a big thing that can come off somebody's plate when they're not having to worry about it. Sure. And, and I think just that like we know like when there's a middle school program to be made, I'm going to make it like when there's a high school program to be made, he's going to make it when there's just decisions that bus request that goes in, I'll do it for this school and you do it for that school. It's just a very clear definition of duties. And if I don't know what one of us is doing or if something needs to be done or something, you have to ask It's And I think that's, that is a huge thing in partnerships everywhere is just let go of whatever hang up you have about it and ask a question did yep. you do that you're not pointing any fingers you're not doing anything you just have to like communicate and i don't know why adults sometimes struggle with that so much but you yeah. just have to say i need you to do this and it's not a power thing i'm not saying it because i i think that's your job and you need to do it and that's at your level it's you just got to get it done the work's got to get done and at the end of the day all of it gets done because that's what the kids need for the yeah. program function and this yeah go ahead sorry yeah no in the grand scheme of things is like everything has to function for the betterment of the program it's not about how tom and i look at the end of the day it's that you're going to be able to tell real quick whether our 130 kids are organized with two people who get along they're not like tessa you just said something though that's so important that if when it comes to this communication piece and this cooperation piece that it my, the one takeaway I would tell anybody is just to communicate. I was talking with my my right hand person here that helps me. Uh, we have a leadership team, but then there's me and this other person that kind of lead the leadership team, set the direction of the company. And we were talking about something, and I had said something that, in a less transparent environment, could have maybe been thought like, "Did I mean something more than what I'm saying?" And I told her, "I was like, by the way, I don't like mean anything else by that. I'm just saying that she's like, trust me, I know you well enough that you'd be much more direct if there was a, a problem." And I hope she meant that positively. Maybe I should double check, but I do try to be direct, and I, I don't want I don't want to be rude or, or, or insensitive or anything, but I want to be clear. And if I'm upset about something, I I will come up and pull an employee aside or in my office and say, "Hey." I got to tell you, I'm upset about something and I want to talk about it. I, I don't make it personal, but I try to be very clear. And I think sometimes we don't do that. And then because we are not communicating our concerns or displeasure, we then start, we get a little passive aggressive. And then we start reading into other people's behaviors and lack of communication. And we may read things into it that are not there. And so I think if we can just be bold enough to just communicate clearly and respectfully with one another that would solve the vast majority of the issues that i see on teams i don't want it to sound like tom and i have the perfect communication pattern all the time that is not the case 
there have been more than one day where I get home at the end of the day and I was like, I was really passive aggressive about that earlier. I'm really sorry. <laughs> and she'll send me a text too and I'm like, I wasn't affected at all. Yeah. Like you didn't get me at all. But I, and I think what it boils down to, and and you're probably picking that up as we're sitting on this video together, is that Tom and I are friends. <laughs> we are friends outside of our program. We talk about stuff other than band. And I, I think that is really important is that we have to know each other, something about each other's lives outside of what we're doing 10 to 12 hours a day during the work week. And so it's important for him to know that, yeah, I can take this if you want to go home and be with your son or put Tommy to bed. And, and he knows, oh, my mom's birthday is this weekend and you're trying to get out of here on a Friday afternoon. You need to know those things about the people that you're working with when you're spending this much time with them. And I think that is a piece that like a lot of directors, they skip over because it's, oh, my work is at work and my home is at home. And yeah, that's true. But if you want your work to be at work and your home to be at home, then your people at work need to know what's important to you. And all that boils down to is we're friends. We talk about stuff that's not banned all the time. Yeah. And so I, yeah. I, I think that's a really important piece too. Yeah, I think that's what we're saying. It's not that we go hang out every weekend or we spend a whole lot of time at each other's houses. It wouldn't be that at all. But it's we don't start our day always talking about bandits. You need to hear this crazy thing that happened to me this weekend or I'll send her a text on the weekend that's not about band. It's just like about, oh, did you see this crazy thing or oh, I'm out with my family at Christmas lights? Because at least then she has an appreciation for what my weekend was. Maybe when I come in and something wasn't done and she was like, well, I know where he was all weekend. And I think that helps. It doesn't solve all those issues. It doesn't mean you don't have those animosities sometimes, but it, it definitely gives you that perspective. I think you're right of that. I know generally what her weekend's going to be about. And I know where mine is. And I know we communicate a couple of weeks out, Hey, this is really important. Like I yeah. what and it's not that hard to accommodate those things. It's really not. And something going back just a little bit, we were talking about as far as communication too, you have to communicate how you're feeling. We came to a, a point this year, unfortunately, we both were put in situations where we ended up getting COVID exactly apart. So we had this thing where we both got COVID thing vaccinated and everything didn't matter. We were just in an environment where we were surrounded by it. So mm -hmm. unfortunately we went through that, but it, it left that there was two full weeks where I taught every, I was the person and there was two full weeks where she was the person because it's Those two weeks back to back. I'm just yes. <laughs> four weeks at the very, and of course it was two weeks into school. But uh, something I learned in that process was like, man, I really missed standing in front of the seventh grade band as much as I used to. I used to do that every day. Like I used to, when I was in Ellsbury, that's all I did. And yes, I wanted, I had to give more of that responsibility to her, but we had a conversation that I really thought she would be not okay with, which was, I, I want to stand in front of the middle school band more. I think I have more to teach there than I do right now. And I don't want to step on your toes because I want to keep the program separate, but can I do more? She, Absolutely. Would you be willing to pick up some of this stuff that you weren't doing before just so that we can, that I can get a little bit more time in front? And I think you have to have that respect. Like I think she, at this point, trusts my vision and direction on what things are going. She came into the program and it's not that she has to kowtow to everything I feel or think, but there's a level of trust here where she knows that if I'm going to stand in front of the seventh grade band, I've got something probably to teach him and vice versa. And that has to be a conversation. And as I said, it's one of those that I, it was really hard for me to approach with her, but it wasn't a problem for me to sit down and talk to her about it. And had I just kept that in the back of my mind and not just sat down and gone, I need to do this. Now, that doesn't mean that it happens every week, but she does now at the beginning of the week go, what days do you want to be in front of the seventh grade this week? And I go, well, we're in the middle of a dizzy trip, so I really got to do this and this. So probably not. Or she knows if I don't show up that day that I had too much work to do at the high school. Like we have, you have to have a give and take there. And I think that's. Yeah, that's great. You guys, this has just been really a. a a remarkable conversation and I'm, I'm glad that we could share some of the basics of communication how you two work together but really loved what we got into of talking about the chop shops and growing the the color guard program and i think that's going to be something that's just going to resonate and hit with a lot of people and it's so funny that i intentionally try to sometimes steer things away from marching band because i think so many times marching band is it has an inordinate amount of focus it's in our program, but it, so many things do come back to it. And it is the program. It's generally our largest program. It's the par program that has the most student involvement. It's the program that uh, is most involved with the community usually. So it's inevitable that it does come down to that. But, but yeah, this was really fantastic. I thoroughly enjoyed it.